How are you? Oh, we, yeah, very well. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah very good. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, nice, we're straining right. our memories here to go back to Marvel UK days, but you know we'll do our best. If we if we don't know the answer to any of your questions or anything like that, we'll just make it up anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, we'll have comes. some runners knocking around with microphones, so if you do have any questions over the course of the panel, just stick your hand up uh, and we'll get to you. But uh, first of all, I'm going to kick things off. Yes. So, uh, let's go right back to the beginning. Why don't you give us a brief introduction of how things came about for you both? Uh, yeah, I mean... Taking you right back, uh, Marvel UK, which had sort of up to that point pretty much been a reprint place. You know, I mean, they'd had some original material with Captain Britain, they'd had Night Raven and a few others. But really, kind of when I came on board, they were really starting to get into licensed comics, and Transformers was one of the first they took on, you know, after Doctor Who. And I was just brought in because they hadn't got enough American material to reprint. They were reprinting the initial four issues or five issues or whatever was out at the time. But they could quickly see, even as a fortnightly, there wouldn't be enough American material to sustain the comic. And it was doing well enough for them that they thought they wanted to keep it going on a, on a fortnightly and then a weekly basis. So they bought, first of all, they bought um, Steve Parkhouse in to write a story called Man of Iron, which was a mixture of colour and black and white and, you know, was kind of quite a step out of the continuity of what the Americans were doing, just because at that point they really didn't kind of want to sort of tread on the toes of what the American comic was doing. So what Steve did was a very kind of uniquely British take on Transformers with Man of Iron. And then I was contacted by a guy called Ian Rimmer, who I'd worked with at uh, IPC, who had become an editor over at Marvel. And he introduced me to Sheila Craner, who was the editor of Transformers UK. And I was asked, I'd, I'd done very little scripting at the time, but Ian had kind of liked what I'd done for Scream, a little horror comic. And he introduced me to Sheila. Sheila really was kind of, you know, in need of writers at the time to generate material. And we really didn't have much to go on except, you know, the original mini-series and, well, very little else at the time. So we just had to spin stories out of that and the, the tech specs from the toys. And I came up with a story called The Enemy Within, which was a Starscream and Brawn story. And, and all those ones were quite character focused just because we couldn't use the big guns like Optimus Prime and Megatron so much because again we didn't know where the American stories were going with them so they tended to be little character pieces to start off with and just gradually as we went along and we became more confident in what we were doing and didn't quite care as much what the Americans thought we started to branch out in bigger directions and start to do kind of stories that had a kind of integrity and meat to them of their own and, and when we got as far as the Transformers the animated movie we just took off in a completely different direction and used the movie cast which we knew the Americans weren't using. So I've got a question. So, <laughs> so Mr. Furman, did, uh, so did Marvel US give you any kind of direction at all? Did they just let you do what you want and then have to over and see it afterwards? Or? There wasn't much direction from Marvel US. We would occasionally get scripts or uh, just photocopies of issues that hadn't actually been printed yet. So we would have an idea where they were going. But as it went along and they got closer and closer to their deadlines, we knew less and less about what was coming up. So we went through this whole process always of trying to leave wherever we left off with the American stories. We would craft our UK stories to leave them the characters pretty much back where they started. Which is the old way of doing comics anyway, isn't it? Yeah. So we just had to make sure all the toys we borrowed were back in the box for the next <laughs> chunk of American stories. But, you know, we, we did start to sort of, like I say, just deviate from what, you know, strictly what the Americans were doing and, and start to take a few, I guess, liberties. And, and when they kind of did think, when a character just dropped off their radar, 
because often, you know, you know, to Bob Budiansky's credit, he had an awful lot of characters to introduce. So sometimes characters would just get completely sidelined very quickly or just drop off the grid. And that was great for us because it meant we could just jump in with stories. And at one point the Dinobots just disappear out of the American story. And we, I think we did about sort of 10 Dinobot stories until they reappeared. So, you know, we were always looking for any opportunity in any characters that the Americans weren't using. So that was the start of your love affair with Grimlock then? Yeah, it was. And, and, and again, we took a liberty with Grimlock because we didn't do him exactly as the Americans did. You know, they, they had this, you know, he was one step up from the kind of dumb character in the cartoons in the American comics. But I still kind of didn't think there was enough character for me there. So I tried to build more into Grimlock and make it that the rest was just a kind of facade. And so, you know, without kind of straying completely away, we tried to kind of add to the characters a bit as well. Um... Yeah, so I've told this story many times. I hope when I tell it now it'll be exactly the same as it was last time I told this story. Um, my, my kind of introduction to Marvel UK was through somebody that I'd been at college with who became an editor there. And he asked me, well I probably asked him actually, I was like, can I do some work for Marvel UK? And he said, okay, we'll do a two-page kind of tryout, if you like, for Thundercats. I've, I've, I've got a, think, a feeling that that was the first thing that I did. So I did a two-page Thundercats, and they really liked what I did, which was great. Um, so then I started doing Thundercats um, strip work, <coughs> and most of it I would post in. I didn't very often take it into the office in London. But occasionally I would. So I went in and took it to the editor, Steve White, um, to give him my latest Thundercat stuff. And, um, and then the person sitting at the de desk next to Steve said, um, obviously thought the work I was doing is absolutely amazing. And he said, <laughs> said, do you want to do some Transformers? And I was like, I don't know, what is a Transformers? I've no idea what that is. So it's like, well, it's like robots, look, like this. And I'm like, well, okay, not really, but yeah, well, I didn't say not really. Inside I was saying not really. I don't want to draw robots, I want to draw superheroes. I don't want to draw Marvel UK, I want to draw Marvel US superheroes. And Thundercats was always the closest thing to superheroes that Marvel UK had. Um, but I was a young freelancer, so I would say yes to everything. Well, everything that paid money. Well, not everything that paid money, but... Um, and nothing's changed. No, it's not. No, I'm just old there. But, um, so so that, uh, that person in the desk next to Steve White was Simon Furman. Um, and so that was the beginning of me doing some Transformers stuff, which I think was some cover artwork, and then I did an annual or something. I mean, normally the way, by this point, I was both editing and writing for the comic which is another little story I'll tell you in a minute, but I was editing Transformers and somebody else was looking at my uh, script so that I wasn't just in total control of everything. But um, normally what we did with new artists was we trialled them on covers first. So all the, all, the, all the artists like Lee Sullivan, Robin Smith, they all started on covers first and then graduated to interiors once we were, you know, they were comfortable with it and, um, and we were comfortable with what they were doing. So, yeah. It seems like in some, I mean, it's the obvious thing to do to, to kind of get an artist to cut his teeth by doing one single illustration as a cover, but at the same time it's slightly odd because the cover is the thing that's going to be seen in the news agents. So to have like a, you know, a, new, a fresh artist on, on the thing that's seen before any of the interiors, it's kind of slightly odd as well. So there's a lot of pressure on you as a, as a young artist to do your best work. Um, but then that's a good thing because it challenges you and it really pushes you. And I, I had no clue who these characters were that I was drawing. I think one of the first ones, I think was Soundwave. That was one of the first. I didn't know who. I thought it was Optimus Prime. <laughs> oh dear. Um, but it was great. Yeah, so I enjoyed doing the covers and then the opportunity to do interior art was great because you feel as though your career has got kick-started. Um, and little did I know how that would then lead on to um, working for, for the US market. But there were some great people at that time. When you, when you kind of think back working for Marvel UK, so, you know, Lee Sullivan, J. 
Jeff seen, you know, uh, like Dougie Braithwaite, you know, some of these people who have Brian gone Hitch. To, uh, Brian Hitch, I mean, you know. <laughs> You know, I mean, these guys who've gone on Barry Kitts and Will Simpson, who's doing Game of Thrones stuff now, you know, it, it really was a kind of roster of artists who've gone on to greater things. Yeah, and then there's me. Uh, yeah. So, you know, the other little story was that in the interim, I, I kind of, I, I joined Marvel UK on staff working on Captain Britain Monthly, as well as writing freelance for Transformers. And then they, they gave me Thundercats to edit, which I was really pleased because it was my first editorial job. And really, I didn't want to then go and edit Transformers, but when Ian Rimmer left staff, I was kind of the obvious choice to become editor. And I just kind of got the first few issues of Thundercats out, so I was quite actually disappointed to have to kind of go back into the Transformers office. And then it, it created this problem of, I was writing and editing the, the title, which Marvel frowned upon generally. So Richard Starkings would script edit my scripts, and that, you know, was kind of how we, we sort of got around that. But yeah, it was by the by the end. I was just kind of it was Transformers everything really. That's when he became Mr. Transformers. <laughs> so when you started working on it, both of you, what, what source material were you drawing from? I mean, Bob Budiansky was writing the U.S. comics. So were you getting his bios through? And Andrew, what artwork were you using to reference? The characters that you were drawing? The, the, the art reference pretty much boiled down to looking at what other people had already drawn. Um, and then those are model sheets, which I think were from the movie, weren't they? From, from the animated from, movie. From the animated series, I yeah. think. And, you know, we had a, eventually we got all the character turnarounds from the TV show, which are just sort of front, back, and side shots, you know, done line work. And, and that was so much better than what we had originally, which was only really the pack art or the toys themselves. So you'll see at one point in Marvel UK storytelling that it goes from artists drawing from the toys to artists drawing from the animated model sheets. And it literally happens in the first two parts of Target 2006. So Galvatron, when he first turns up in Target 2006, is the toy. And then suddenly he was the movie model sheet in the next episode. I never got any toys. <laughs> Right, we've also got some runners as well knocking around um, at either side of the hall, so if you have any questions, just stick your hand up. Um, oh, and we've already got some. Yeah, questions, come on. Oh, hello. Uh, this is a question for Simon. Uh, in the Letters page of issue 170, it says that you and Jeff Senior went on Surprise Surprise to promote Dragon's Wars. What, what was that like? Oh, uh, according to one of the letters, oh, hello. According to one of the letters pages, uh, you and Jeff Senior went on Surprise Surprise uh, to promote Dragon's Wars. Uh, what was it like being on Surprise Surprise? You know, I mean, it was it, Jeff. I mean, Jeff was one of the, sort of the, the, you know, one of my favourite artists to work with on Transformers. Anyway, so you know, I mean, it, it was great to sort of when we got the we hit that stage in Marvel UK where they were going to sort of do American format comics. You know, uppermost in our mind was getting Jeff moved off Transformers and onto one of those. So, you know, we, we, we very much used all the other Marvel UK titles to springboard the launch of Dragon's Claws, or Dragon's Teeth as it was originally. And in fact, as, as it was advertised, but, um, you know, I mean, Jeff, you know, it was always the idea to get Jeff onto, you know, something we thought showcased his talents even more than Transformers was doing. And, you know, the, the good thing with Marvel UK is, we, you know, everything got cross-promoted and flagged up in, in all the other titles. So I think we did a little sort of one-page kind of house ad that we got Jeff to draw, draw on that. And, yeah, it was very much, you know, sort of, that was the stage where we just kind of Jeff really left Transformers behind for a while. Does that actually answer your question? I'm not totally sure. Yeah. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> it's all made up anyway, doesn't it? Uh, we've got somebody over here. 
As David said earlier, you two are pretty much the godfathers of Transformers. Um, I've got two questions, without wanting to sound like a real fanboy. Thanks for what you've done over the years. Unleash the fanboy. Absolutely. You. Um, first of all, Regeneration 1, and you said that was the end for Transformers for the two of you. Is this, I know you've said it in the past, anymore? It never ends, apparently. It never ends. <laughs> um, you know, it was, uh, what, what, what Regeneration 1 was really, was the end of that story. I mean, I doubt it's the end of my involvement with Transformers, you know. I'm always happy to do more. But right now, my career and Andrew's career, has, I think we've just got sort of taken different directions. And I'm doing a lot more screenwriting, which is something I want to keep the momentum going with. So, you know, at the moment, there's just no room, really, for Transformers. But th ultimately, there will always be kind of, you know, a chance for me to return to it, I hope. Yeah, I mean, for me, Regen was... It was great because it was an opportunity to, not just in a story sense, tie up loose ends, because that's more kind of Simon's thing, but just as an artist, it always... It kind of felt incomplete before as an artist, even though, you know, I've done many, many other things. Um, and, then, and then I always felt like a bit of a fraud coming to all these conventions, you know, having, because it, I wasn't involved in Transformers anymore. So it was nice to have a second bite of doing Transformers stuff, but on something that was, no kidding, a conclusion to the work that we'd done before. So, so it was very complete in that sense. I don't, I don't know an awful lot about, or, and subsequently don't have much particular affection for all the new versions of Transformers, not because I don't like it, but just because I, don't, I haven't had any involvement with it. Um, but G1 I did, because I mean, it, it lo launched my career, so I have a lot of affection for it. Um, and, and so it was nice to really round that off in a, in a very, very complete way. I, I don't think I'll ever do any Transformers anymore. Um, I mean, I'm doing this sketchbook thing, has anybody? No, <laughs> Raymond's nodding his head. Yeah, I'm doing this sketchbook challenge thing that I, that I set myself. I don't, Simon probably doesn't even know about this. Because okay, Simon is not on social media. <laughs> so, um, no, I set myself a challenge. I was doing so many sketches. People asking me to do sketches, you know, emailing me, can you do a sketch of this, whatever. So I started to do all these things. I set up a, a Patreon page. Um, so that people could have an invested interest in what I was doing around kind of Transformers sketches and also some canvases. I'm doing some large format canvases for an exhibition. Um, but then the sketch thing, I thought, I've done so many of these, they ought to be in a book. You know, I just do them and they go. So I started to scan them in and then I announced that I was going to do a sketch of every single Transformers character that appeared in the original Marvel uh, G1 Universe book. Um, well, that unleashed a bloody nightmare, didn't it? <laughs> so, so people were saying, so, so how many is that then? I'm like, I don't know, it's about 200. And they're like, really? <laughs> so Bob Budiansky got in touch with me and he said, well, I'll send you the list of 256 that I named. Um, it kind of went off from there, but I mean, there will be a limit to this thing. The limit for me is the Marvel Transformers universe stuff, which, I mean, the book itself is limited, and then there were others that appeared in the back of the comics. I was sent digital files by J.P. Bove of all that stuff, just as reference anyway, a long time ago. So that's going to be my target, plus a couple of others. I'll probably put, I'm putting the Mega Ratch character in there, because that's one that, you know, kind of been involved with. And probably a few others, Ember and Zaron, maybe, just ones that I, I was involved with. So don't ask me for stuff that isn't in. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's going quite well. I think I've done about 27 so far. Um, and so, if, don't laugh. Not many so to go. Don't give a face. <laughs> Bloody editors. Um, so, yeah, so if you, if you look at my, if you go to my blog address, which is andrewwildman.net, that links to my Patreon page. You don't have to sign up to Patreon. You don't have to pay me any, any money. You can just have a look and you can see most of the sketches that are coming up. Not all of them, but you can see most of them. So, so, and I'd love you to have a look, and I'd love you to comment, and I'd love you to ask for characters just as so I can say, no, I'm not going to do that one. <laughs> Impactor. Yeah, see, you know, <laughs> a 
like that. Yeah, ask for that, and then I can say no, because I don't do Transformers anymore. And, and is there going to be, once you've managed to do 300, 500? Shut up with that. I'm just saying. 200. And are, are, are you going to be, are we going to be able to get the book? And the book? Yeah. The book. <laughs> um, yeah, well, the, the original idea was that I'll do all of these and then I'll publish them in a, in a book, self-publish them in a book to sell at conventions. I'll probably release it in parts, just so that people can, you know, maybe three or four parts, whatever. Sell them at conventions, maybe sell them online, um, because we're kind of allowed to do that thing. It's not really legal, but they don't mind too much. Um, so, yeah, they will be available as, as a book, yeah. Uh, you had another question, didn't you? I have. Yeah. Uh, just also wanted to ask if you could tell us a bit about the transition over to US Marvel when uh, Bob Budiansky asked you to go over, I believe, and how that worked. Yeah, I mean, eventually we, we got to meet, you know, Bob, you know, from being just yeah. a kind of name on a, a script that we used to see. Bob came over for one visit and you know we actually kind of got to meet Bob and that kind of smoothed lots of things you know once you actually get the face to face with somebody and it helped the flow of information and then the next time Bob came over we went for lunch in Covent Garden and he basically said I'm leaving the book do you want it and you know at that point my dream was working for Marvel America so you know of course I said yes and then Bob qualified this by saying it will probably be cancelled in four issues. So, I, you know, but I thought I'll take four issues of Marvel US work. And, you know, sort of to our credit, I guess we got something like 25 issues out of it. So um, that was great. And, you know, and from, you know, from going to work straight with Jose Delbo, who's a lovely guy, and, you know, that was great. But I was very pleased when we started to get Jeff on the book, and then Andrew came on and took it on regularly. So it just kind of gradually, we just sort of took more of the reins of it, I guess. But, yeah, it was just done very casually, really, with Bob. I mean, I, I was only going to be a fill-in artist while Jeff went to do the Death's Head graphic novel. So I, I was only going to do four issues. But it was like, wow, I'm going to work for Marvel US. So they asked me to do a, a sample page. Can you do a sample double page spread? And, and, and they turned me down. I did these samples. They said, no, you're not good enough. I was like, what? Okay, fine. That was my one chance of playing. And then they got... Dwayne Turner. Dwayne Turner, who really wasn't into Transformers at all. No, I mean, he's a great artist, but he just wasn't really suited to it. But in a way, kind of his lack of interest helped us, because then when I went back to Don Daly, the editor, and said, now can we have Andrew? He, sort of, he just kind of, you know, caved at that point. And, and the thing was that when, when I was briefed on doing the sample that I did to try and get the book, um, uh, Don Daly said to me, we don't do Transformers here the way that you do it in the UK. So all that stuff that you draw in the UK with, you know, saliva and teeth and all that kind of organic stuff going on, don't do that. We don't do that. Make them look like robots, like Jose does, you know. Um, so that's what it did, and they turned it down. So when they came back, they said, do what you like, don't really care. So that's when I started doing all the the saliva and the teeth and all that kind of thing and people seem to like it so so I just carried on doing that. So what was your working relationship like? Simon were you... It's terrible, we hate each other. <laughs> yeah we don't talk. No. Uh, we, it's were painful you, to be seeing it. So. Were you fully scripting the comics and giving them to Andrew or were you just overviewing the story to Andrew and Andrew was doing most of the story plotting in terms of the pages and things? I mean, it was, it was different on the UK because we worked full script, so they were quite, you know, detailed, the scripts, and there wasn't much wriggle room for Andrew in them. I mean, you know, I always look at it as a collaborative thing, and we always open the door to changes and whatever else, but full script is full script. It's kind of, that's, those are the panels, those are the shots, that's where the dialogue goes. But when we started on the American comic, they worked Marvel plot style, which is just a kind of block of text which kind of tells the story with some idea of pages in it and then Andrew does all the kind of breaking down. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the full script thing works really well for Marvel UK because there are so few pages. I mean, you'd have like, what, six pages or something in an issue. So, so the writer, and certainly a writer like Simon, who's, who's an editor as well, they can, they can keep it really tight and get the maximum storytelling out of half a dozen pages. 
Um, but because we're the American books, they're 22 pages, so you've got you've got the room to for the writer to to kind of plot it a bit more loosely, and then that that as an artist, that's a joy because it gives you the opportunity to get so much more drama in there visually. Um, it's a kind of hard thing to get used to when you've been working full script to work on a plot, but once you get used to it, it's definitely the it's definitely the the more fulfilling way to work as an artist. Okay, uh, we've got a question at the back there. Hi, um, you're going on about your working relationship, and obviously you two have been working together for quite some time. Um, if you can remember back, what were your first impressions of each other like? Were they favourable or negative or...? What, in a, in a professional sense or a personal sense? <laughs> Whatever's funniest. <laughs> and most honest. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think pretty soon we, we became kind of friendly. I mean, you know, more than just kind of an editor and a, an artist. I think we just got on really well on a personal level. And, you know, I mean, I knew Andrew had kind of talent and, and, and I slightly used my editor's skills to try and kind of bring that out, I guess, a little more. Bring it out, yeah. You know, but... Nurture it. That was a nurturing, nurturing you, Simon. You were. But, yeah. I mean, I do think, you know, Andrew's progression kind of was very rapid, you know, in terms of just kind of getting into the flow of, of you know, kind of weekly comics or monthly comics. And, and yeah, you know, I mean, it, I don't think we ever really look back. And we still work together today. Yeah, I mean, the thing about the Marvel UK office back then was that, I mean, I didn't go into the office much, but... The times that I did go in, it was a real fun place to be. I mean, there were a bunch of guys just having fun doing comics. You know, it was incredible. So, so there was a, a, a nice kind of social atmosphere there. Anyway, we're all similar kind of age, interested in similar kind of stuff, same kind of movies, all that kind of thing. So, so I think everybody got on got on really well. But um, I th we just wrote really well together. I mean, he's a tough editor. Like, seriously, but that, that has benefited me enormously. I mean, he didn't hold back when he would say to me, you know, in a very deadpan way, well, you know, this doesn't work and that doesn't work, and I, I think, I really think you could do better, you know, in a, what seemed like a quite patronising way. And I was, you know, as an artist, as a young artist, you think, oh, fuck you, you know. <laughs> But you just kind of suck it up, and you just think, no, I need, I just need to do. A, I need to do what the editor's asking for, and B, it's an opportunity to learn from somebody who's been in comics longer than, than I have, um, and that's that's the way that you develop. And I think through that that sort of cooperation, um, we just realised that we could we could get the best result for the product. And that's always the thing, it's a commercial thing, so you need to get the best result for the product. I mean, my standard editorial technique was to go through all the good points, you know, the, you know and, and generally it's like, oh, this is great, love this scene, and then there would be a kind of pause and then the but. <laughs> And then, you know, sort of, I would go through the stuff that I wanted changed. And I, you know, I was tough, you know, on all artists who, who kind of worked for me on Transformers. And, you know, I still will kind of argue the toss with Andrew or whoever on the, on things. You know, we had a little sort of, shall I say, dialogue on issue 100 of Regeneration 1, you know. Where, you know, I just kind of thought, it, it could have been better, you know, and we talked about it. They don't it. know about this. Don't spoil it for them. They, they, <laughs> think, they think we live together or something. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's, a, it's always been a collaborative thing for me, so the closer I can kind of work and be in contact with the artist, the better. Okay, we've got a question over here. Um, in Regeneration, 85, there was a scene where Optimus had a vision of Unicron returning. Was there any plan of having Unicron join the regeneration finale, or was that just like a red herring? Yeah, we, we weren't going to bring a Unicron into it, but it, it just kind of was, we were trying to sort of include as much kind of pull from the old series as possible and really it was just to kind of show uh, Optimus Prime's state of mind at the time which was trouble to say the least and it was just kind of a general foreboding of something to happen but you know did we kind of tease it and not deliver yeah I reckon we did but you know it was just nice to kind of pull that thread forwards from the old series 
I mean, it, it would have been wrong to do the whole series and not have Unicron there in some form or, or another. So to have that as, them, as illustrated as some of Prime's mental anguish was uh, just a perfect way to do it. Really. It's his nightmare. You know? What do you think about the current IDW verse? Well, I mean, as someone who kind of started the current IDW verse, I love it. You know? <laughs> but I mean, to be honest, I think they're doing great stuff at the moment. I mean, you know, and I, I hope he's not listening, but particularly James Roberts, who's who's kind of taken the spirit of some of the kind of you know stuff I see did in the original Asian series and kind of run with those and expanded on those and, and you know he's done it in his own inimitable style so yeah I think there's some great stuff at the moment, really good. I, I don't read any of it, I'm embarrassed to say, um, but clearly it's good. I mean you can tell that by the reception that you guys give to certain people when they come up so there's absolutely no doubt that James is, is doing an incredible job so yeah. James gets quite a, um, a rap for his body count, but really he isn't anywhere in either of your leagues in terms of just the amount of characters that you'd like to kill off. There's one story that you told many years ago at an auto assembly, and I don't know if you've talked about it recently, but for anybody who's new here, it made me howl with laughter. What was the story about the robot sheep? Yeah, um... We, what, I'm sure I've told this story many times, but when I was when when we were kind of in in our sort of run of American issues, and Rob Tokar was editing. Rob was a great guy, and he was sort of game for a sort of practical joke. And we were, we were interested to know whether Hasbro were really paying attention much. They just seemed to kind of pass everything without comment. And you know, Transformers were waning and I think their attention was elsewhere a bit. But we decided to test how much attention Hasbro were paying to the plots we were sending them. By, by putting together a joke one for April Fool's Day. You know, and we made sure the memo was very clearly marked with first of the fourth or fourth or four one, whatever year it was. And we sent off a plot that was just ridiculous. It had, you know, cup chasing giant robotic sheep around the ark, and they were packed with explosive. And he was he was after them in a kind of carnal way. And um, and if he, if he caught it, it was going to detonate the ark. And and Galvatron was fighting a, a twenty foot nun. And and you know and and it just went on like that. And in the end. There's just like everybody dies, and the next issue just says, Oh, hang on, we don't know, everybody's dead, and we tend it off. And we heard nothing back from Hasbro, and we started to really worry about this because we wonder whether you know there was they had a sense of humor or whether we were all gonna lose our jobs. And you know, and and finally Rob sort of you know bit the bullet and called um, a guy called Vinny, who was one of the two guys who approved the stuff. And he asked him whether he'd, you know, read the, the treatment we'd send. And Vinny said, yeah, we, we've, we've got a couple of concerns. And we were just like, oh God. <laughs> but no, I think, you know, it, and Rob kind of went on and on until they got that it was April the 1st and April Fools. And, and actually they loved it. They just thought, oh, you guys, you comics guys, you know. And they, you know, actually it kind of, if anything, it improved our relationship with Hasbro afterwards, but there were some nervy moments there where we just kind of, we could have overstepped the mark. I, I think we need to draw that story. We need to write and draw that story. Do you want to see that story? <laughs> some, somewhere, um, I don't know whether it's still online, but Rob Tokar did a, um, a little sort of trip down. I mean, he, he, he still had a copy of it, but couldn't find it. But his memory was much better than mine of some of the details of that story. So I don't know whether it's still out there on the World Wide Web somewhere, but, but Rob did do a piece about this April Fool's Hasbro joke. So maybe it's still out there somewhere. Uh, right, we've got a question down here. Um, you, uh, you both kind of touched on this a bit earlier, but um, when, you were, when you first started doing the English-British storylines, what was the general reaction from the States? Did they accept it? Did they notice it? Did they, did they care? 
I think they almost barely noticed it at first. I mean, I think, you know, we, we sent them, we sent them kind of plot, scripts, art, you know, anything we could, but generally, we kind of just, you know, we, we took no feedback as good feedback and just went on our merry way with it. But generally, I don't think we were, they were that aware or that, you know, we were some strange little outpost colony thing. In, in, the, in, the, in some small island that most of them had never visited. And I just don't think they really sort of kind of connected it to theirs at all. You know, Bob was aware of it. I knew that from talking to him later. But, you know, they generally just kind of, you know, I think it was just like, yeah, rubber stamp, yeah, you know. And, and, and I just don't think they were really aware of it at all. And even, you know, to, up to the point where, you know, I took over the American series. I still don't think the, the, the Americans were really cognizant of what we were doing. They, I don't think Marvel generally as a, co as a company were interested, by the time, certainly by the time I got into it, towards the end, they weren't particularly interested in the book anyway. Because the, the, I, when I started working on the book, I thought, yeah, I'm working for Marvel US, this is amazing. So I went over to America to meet the editor and Mike, all that kind of thing, and Rob, Rob Tokar was showing me around the, the Marvel offices and introducing me to, to various other editors, saying, oh, this is Andrew Wadden, he's an artist from the UK. And they'd say, oh, what, what is it you're, you're doing for us? I say, Transformers. And more than, more than a couple of editors said, do we still do that book? Like, they just weren't interested at all. It was just one of the, the end of a clutch of toy books that they'd been doing. And they, they were just kind of running it down. because they, they made a decision that they didn't want to do toy books anymore. So. G.I. Joe lasted longer, but essentially they didn't want to do those books anymore. Ha ha ha! We're all still here! <laughs> okay, we've got a question just over at the back there. Death's Head. Where did the inspiration come for Death's Head and to bring him into the Transformers universe? And also, did he talk with a British accent? Um, well, I mean, the inspiration for Death's Head was just mostly that the story he was in, Wanted Galvatron Dead or Alive, was a kind of homage to spaghetti westerns. It was a sort of robot outer space spaghetti western. And every spaghetti western needs a bounty hunter. So, you know, we just dropped a bounty hunter character in. And really he was meant to be in a couple of issues, killed off, and that was the end of it. But when we saw Jeff's amazing visual for him, that was when we kind of made other wheels move to get him kind of, you know, copyrighted Marvel and I added bits to his personality and, and just generally we built him up into a much bigger character until he was kind of ready to make the move into his own book. Um, you've created Death's Head. It's me, Sam. I'm here. <laughs> You've created Death's Head, um, and we did have, when Buddy Adsky started on the comics, a few crossovers with Marvel characters, Spider-Man for example. Um, but really in the American run, you didn't, or in the UK run, you didn't really touch on any Marvel characters. Was that a deliberate choice? Was that something that would have been difficult to do, or...? I think possibly by the time I was writing the American comic, they, 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 had, they had kind of shied away completely from that connections to the other Marvel Universe. I think it was something they threw in to the original miniseries when it was only ever going to be an original miniseries and they didn't really, you know, think much beyond that. Or, you know, I think Spider-Man was just a kind of bump sales up in it, as you'd expect. And, you know, they had a kind of throwaway reference to the Savage Land and then really, you know, kind of, they, they took Circuit Breaker out into Contest of Champions, I think it was, just so that she could be, or, or Secret Wars, I forget which it was, just so that she could be a Marvel character. But other than that, I think very quickly they steered entirely away from crossing it over into the Marvel Universe. I think it was just one of those things they did and possibly didn't really think about at the time. Okay, have we got, uh, yeah, got a question down here. Hiya. Were you um, ever under pressure to write or draw new characters for toy lines, or was it up to you when you introduced characters or developed characters? I mean, I, I think, again, by the time we, I mean, it, it never, occasionally with the UK, we had to tie into a, a toy launch. 
you know, it was worth our while because we used to get reciprocal advertising on the TV spots for, you know, whichever toy line it was, the headmasters or the, you know, the new leaders, you know, and we'd get a little sort of flash on the TV advert of the comic, which was worth its weight in gold, really. So we were happy to kind of steer the storyline to have the headmasters maybe ahead of when they were originally, the special teams. So we would often do that, but generally Marvel didn't ask that much of the UK department in that. That was more Bob's, you know, sadly he had to keep just churning the characters in. And by the time, you know, I and we took over on the American comic, there weren't new toy lines to feed in, you know. By then we'd reached Micro Masters and there weren't really subsequent, you know, we put the Action Masters in, but we did it more you know, out of, off on our own volition than Hasbro making a dictate of it. I just don't think they were as invested in the line and the comic at the time, so so no, not really. I, I mean, it doesn't really affect me. I, I just draw whatever was scripted, you know, so... I just kind of, that was already filtered through, you know, it's just new characters. I never really saw them as toys, because I never had any toys. I was too old to have, you know, had them as toys. Um, so to me, they were always just characters. So when, when like Action Masters, Grimlock or whatever, because in the toys, they're really small, aren't they? I, I didn't even, largely, I didn't even know that. To me, they were just a new character and, and some, some of them really cool looking characters. So I was just interested in the narrative and the, and the comic. So didn't know what was going on with the toys. Oh, uh, got a question over here? Uh, when Transformers merged with Action Force, it was kind of, uh, looking back at it, it seemed like it was, uh, it may have come in from outside. How did that merger go from your perspective, Simon? I mean, it's, it's a kind of a little UK tradition that, co that, that comics that were cancelled got folded into other comics. It used to happen a lot in kind of, you know, like, Eagle and Tiger and Battle and something, you know, they, they'd fold them in for a while so they kept hold of the, the title and the license. And that was really what they did with, when Action Force finished its 50 issue or whatever it was run. You know, they, they, you know, we'd already done a little crossover story, so, you know, and they were both Hasbro property, so it seemed like a, a reasonable fit. And, you know, it, it, honestly, I never thought it was a great fit you know, once we kind of tied the two comics together, because all we had to use were the American G.I. Joe stories, which never felt like an easy sort of fit with Transformers. You know, I always liked it when we had, you know, another robot story or another licensed toy story or uh, an Iron Man story, something that had, you know, some kind of resonance, however vague. But the Action, uh, action Force G.I. Joe never kind of felt the best fit to me. You know, in an alternate universe somewhere, back then, the comic was actually Transformers and My Little Pony. <laughs> right, um, Andrew, you, you've said, I think, a number of times that you've, when you drew characters like Galvatron, you were thinking of Jack Nicholson and things like that. Am I right or am I making that did up? I, did I say that? That's she, good. Yeah, I said that. Yeah. yeah. Oh well, okay, because then that brings me on to my question, which is, you know, was that something you did regularly or, but clearly <laughs> All I'm not... the time. <laughs> All the time. Um, I probably did say that. I remember doing... I think, I don't know whether it was for a convention or for something. Somebody asked me to do an illustration of Galvatron just as a, a fun piece to put in a convention book. I can't remember what it was. Um, and it was a bit inappropriate actually, but I did a picture of Galvatron holding a, a toy doll, doll by the legs, pulling it apart with this manic grin on his face. And that was a very Jack Nicholson grin, yeah, you know, thinking of the Joker and life kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the things I really enjoyed about Transformers, was getting those, it sounds, it sounds like it shouldn't work, but getting those human characteristics into, in, into, the, into Transformers characters. Because they weren't robots to me. I mean, they're not robots. I had this conversation on Facebook the other day, somebody was talking about, it's going to be a weekend full of robots. It's like, Transformers are not robots. Like, if you follow the definition of robots, they're clearly, they're not that, they're sentient beings. 
they just happen to be mechanically based sentient, sentient beings. But um, so I always thought of them more as yeah, as exactly that. They have they have emotion. I mean, they do. There's a lot of emotion in there, and that's the stuff that I used to draw on. So to then channel human emotion and to use examples of actors. It's always useful to use actors as an example when you're portraying characters in comic books. Very often writers will refer to that. This character is like whatever and they'll reference a, a movie star or whatever. So so yeah, Jack Nicholson was probably yeah. And you used to put all those little visual gags in, didn't you? Like you had sort of ladies and gents toilet doors on Unicron and things like that. So, yeah. so you had a little sort of male symbol and female symbol on him. Yeah. So yeah, you used to throw all that stuff in, didn't you? There was, there was one cover I did, I can't remember what it was, but it was like a, a top shot looking down a piece of whatever, a piece of environment, you know, Cybertron in an environment, and there was a doorway at the bottom, and I think there was an milk, empty milk bottle outside, ready for milk there. But, I mean, that's the thing, you know, you draw this stuff, and after a while, you just, not that you're getting bored, but you just start to throw in little Easter eggs, you know, whatever. So, so yeah, I did put the male and female symbols on Unicron. Sorry, sorry if that upset anyone, but who knows, they might actually be on there somewhere. Who's to say he doesn't have, you know, conveniences in him somewhere, you know? It would make sense, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs>